when the Great Ajahns weren't practicing in the forest. They were out alone in the forest. What kept them going was the realization that they weren't alone. They belonged to something much larger. They belonged to the culture of the Noble Ones. This is a culture you can join simply by adopting the values. And you want to remind yourself of those values, especially here in this land of wrong view. Because otherwise you start feeling lonely, you start feeling that you're the only person practicing. And your values aren't in line with other people's values, and they don't just sit by and watch neutrally. Most people try to tend to push you in their direction. Do what they do. Think the way they think. So think of how the noble ones would respond to that. And John Fung's image one time was of people who have stepped in dog shit, and then they want to make sure everybody else steps in dog shit, too. You've got to think in those terms if you want to survive, if you want your practice to survive. So think about the values and the customs of the Noble Ones. There are four altogether. The first three have to do with contentment. You're content with whatever food, clothing, shelter you get. You're not constantly thinking about ways to make the food better, or the clothing better, or the shelter better. And that's something that's really lacking. But if these things serve their purpose, and that's one of the reasons why we have that reflection every evening, to remember what their purpose is, then you've got enough. You don't need to be ambitious to make yourself large in the world, just for the sake of more food, more clothing, more shelter. Because as I say, if you have a thousand sets of clothing, you can only wear one at a time. And that frees you. It frees you from all the extra work you'd have to do to get things that are basically extraneous, that are there only for show. And that allows you to focus on the, the most important of the, the customs and noble ones. And that's to delight in developing skillful qualities and to delight in abandoning unskillful qualities. In other words, you have to make yourself want to do these things. Sometimes it doesn't happen all the time. It doesn't happen naturally. Even when you're practicing, sometimes the momentum begins to wear out. And you need to give yourself pep talks to remind yourself of why you're doing this and why it's a good thing. You're learning to make a judgment call as to what's worth doing what's not, and taking delight in what is really worth doing. The mind calculates these things all the time. There's a part of the brain that keeps saying, is this worth it? The energy that goes here, is it worth it? Its energy goes there, is that worth it? So it's functioning. The problem is it often mixed functions, either based on our own past experiences or our own lack of clarity on what the results of our actions will be. And so a lot of the training is learning how to read our actions so we can make a better judgment call as to what's worth it what's not. Wisdom begins with those questions. What, when I do it, will lead to my long-term welfare and happiness? What, when I do it, will lead to my long-term harm and suffering? Looking at everything in terms of actions, after all this reality that we're trapped in, 
that we've created and we keep on creating through our own fabrication. You could say it's a web of fabrications. It sounds like a web of lies, but it's not, that's not quite what the word fabrication means here. It's something that's put together. We're constantly assembling it, and it's constantly falling apart, and we keep assembling it some more. We're driven to this because we like to feed on these things. We think it's worth the effort that goes into it, so we get the food that comes out. The problem is sometimes we're impatient. We want food right now, so we're not too picky about what we get right now. As long as we get something right now, we're happy. This is one of the reasons why we try to find alternative sources of food, try to get another visceral pleasure aside from the pleasure of sight, sound, smells, taste, tactile sensations. The pleasure of concentration is a substitute. As the Buddha once said, you can know all the drawbacks of sensuality, but if you don't have an alternative pleasure, then you're going to go back to feeding off the old things that you told yourself were bad, because you don't see the alternative. It's not right there. So this is one of the ways that we keep ourselves on the path. After all the Buddha, called, when he's describing the Eightfold Path, there's one point where he calls concentration the main factor and the rest are the auxiliary factors or the helping factors. But the big one is right concentration. And this is where you get to use pleasure in a skillful way. And as you gain the pleasure, you stay focused on the breath, but at the same time you learn an important thing about pleasure, that if you go running after the pleasure, you're going to lose the cause. So you stick with the cause and enable the pleasure to develop on its own. And it'll do its work. You don't have to gobble it down. It'll suffuse through the body, nourish whatever immediate, feel you need, <coughs> immediate need you feel for a sense of well-being. That puts you in a better place to make a better judgment about what's worth doing and what's not. When the Buddha talks about developing discernment from that first question, a lot of it depends, focuses on actions. There's the discernment that comes with learning how to tell yourself, not only tell yourself, but to get yourself to do things you don't like to do, but you know are going to give long-term results. And the discernment that gets you to stop yourself from doing things that you'd like to do but are going to give long-term harm. It's practical. It's strategic. And we develop it how? By being virtuous, by doing virtuous things, by being generous, by giving. And as we gain discernment by acting. The Buddha gives you good ways to act. He recommends this. You act this way, and you're going to get good results. You put it to the test. You find it's true. There is a sense of well-being. That when you give something, the well-being that you gain inside is worth much more than the object you gave. And it's much more yours. It becomes your karma now. It becomes a habit. It becomes a quality of the mind. The same with virtue. If you really put virtue into practice, the precepts, you follow them, try to make it an absolute promise you make to yourself, you're going to stick to these precepts. You find that it catches you in things that you used to do and that used to think were okay, but you begin to realize, okay, they have their, their drawbacks. And again, you have to learn how to think strategically. So you can stick to the precept not to lie, and stick to the precept not to kill. Even in situations where it's difficult. So you gain discernment by learning how to act properly. This makes you more and more sensitive to the role that you play in shaping your experience. When you finally get to the more subtle levels of discernment, for example, the Buddha's questionnaire on inconstancy, stress, and not-self, 
basically comes down to not trying to come to the conclusion that there is no self. The conclusion is, is it worth to create the activity of a self? In other words, to make a sense of self, or make a me or make a mine. And you learn how to apply those, those questions strategically. In other words, while you're developing concentration, you don't apply them to the concentration. You apply them to things that would pull you away. When you're trying to be virtuous, when you're trying to be generous, again, you apply those questions to things that would pull you away from these practices. And it's only when the path is fully developed that you apply it to everything. Begin to notice it's a value judgment. Is it worth saying, this is me, this is mine? Inside is always a judgment call. And you want to learn how to delight in making more and more skillful judgments. I was talking on this theme a few days ago, and a woman came up afterwards. I was up in the Bay Area. You know, this is a Buddhist group. And still she said, gee, thinking about how my actions shape my life, that's putting a whole new perspective on things. It means my life isn't shaped by my DNA. And the answer is, well, yes, yeah, so this is what the Buddha is talking about. You shape your life. This, he's putting you in a position of power. The question is, are you going to maintain that position of power or are you going to succumb? To the parts of the mind that don't want to put all the effort into being skillful. But if you learn how to remind yourself of this, puts you in the culture of the noble ones. This is one way of motivating yourself taking a sense of joy, delighting in what you're doing. You can motivate yourself through heedfulness. You can motivate yourself through skillful shame, skillful pride, compassion. Compassion for others, compassion for yourself. Or you can do it simply through this, the pride that comes from learning how to do something skillfully, to make more and more skillful judgment calls. Another person that evening said, you're making the sound all very ordinary and psychological. Well, that's how it starts. You start by looking at yourself as an agent and ask yourself, how can I be a more skillful agent? How can I make my decisions more skillfully? And you just pursue this to more and more deep levels, subtle levels. And to find that what you start taking apart is not ordinary. You get to a very deep level. and the effect it has on your experience of the senses gets very radical. It opens you up to another dimension. There is a dimension that is unfabricated. It doesn't require that you keep attending to it and keep feeding it or feeding off it. Everything is unconditioned in that dimension. It doesn't require all this constant care. And opening up to that dimension is very radical. the final acts and the path that allow you to do that, those are judgment calls as well. So if you're going to learn how to get to that radical level, you have to first develop the ordinary everyday level of learning to be more skillful in how you speak and how you think and how you act. Looking at what you're doing, remembering what you should be doing, and looking to see if you actually are doing it. like the lesson we had on the clothesline today. You remember which side of the robe to expose to the sun, and then you check to make sure that that is the side of the robe you're exposing. And then you look at the results. The robe doesn't fast. <laughs> the robe doesn't fade so quickly. Simple things like that, but you move from the simple things to the more subtle ones. And there's a greater sense of self-esteem that comes as you learn to make more and more precise and skillful judgment calls. So remember, as you go through the day, everything you do is a choice. Everything you do involves intention. And if you learn how to look carefully at them, these intentions and these choices, 
and stick with the desire to be as skillful as possible, to be a member of that noble culture, the culture of the noble ones. You find that you do take more and more joy and more and more delight in developing what's skillful, abandoning what's unskillful, and the results go deeper and deeper. Uh, Lumpudun once said, the practice is one thing clear through. He didn't say what that one thing was. It's actually a cluster of things, but they all work together. And one of them is this ability to make better and better judgment calls. That's what your discernment is. That's what insight is. It's a practice that on whatever level you notice that you're making it a decision, making a choice. And you see how the path and your life all connect.